Hello, and thank you for joining us on another episode of Mindset. I'm your host, Andrew Egan. This episode's guest was Norma Dykus Pennykoff, an active member of our arts community. She's an alternative image maker and a Tennessee native. Her story is an epic one. Um, throughout her life, she's had to put her passions on hold and then bring them back into the spotlight and kind of, you know, compromise on certain things so that she could do other things that were important to her. But along her path, what she didn't do was stop. She didn't put her passion on a shelf, so to speak. She just put it on a pause, as she, as she says in her interview. Um, what she did was make tough choices. She listened to her gut. She followed through with those things. And now she gets to do exactly what she loves doing, helping other people and creating awesome art. Um, she also teaches us that support in your life is, is extremely important and being perseverant enough to push through the times where you're not sure how this is going to go um, and what that looks like on a practical daily level. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode. Here is Norma Dykus Pennycuff. Norma Dykus Pennycuff, and I'm an artist living in Eagle River, Wisconsin, and I do analog photography and alternative process photography work, image making, I guess. And so what are some of the alternative processes? Um, so cyanotype, which is printing in blue, like the original blueprints, and um, I haven't gotten into it yet, but I have a tintype kit, and I'm hoping to explore tintype image making. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Tennessee, in Sweetwater, Tennessee, which is the eastern part of the state, um, not far from Knoxville, just kind of a reference point for people. Yeah. What was it like growing up in Tennessee? Warmer. Uh, <laughs> it was nice. I mean, it is the Bible Belt, but I never felt constrained by that growing up, um, I grew up in a fairly liberal church, which is probably not liberal for the rest of the United States, but it was liberal for that area. Um, I grew up near the mountains, so I got used to, um, like Mother's Day, my family would go up to the mountains and play in snow because there was always snow for Mother's Day, and then we'd come back to where it was warm. Kind of missing that right now, but <laughs> yeah, it was it was good. Um, my parents are both in education, or were. Um, my mom was a speech pathologist, so I sound East Tennessee, but not as much as I could. And my dad was supervisor of education. So not the superintendent, but helped pick out curriculum, helped, I think, direct kind of teachers and their teaching style. Um, yeah. So parents that were active and visible in the community. Did that kind of shape you as you were growing up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Especially if there was a teacher who maybe didn't care for my dad's input. There was a couple of times I learned about sarcasm <laughs> as a younger child. I remember walking down the hallway in the elementary school and a newer teacher coming up and going, you know, your daddy's a real piece of work. And I thought, he does work. Yeah. Yeah. I guess he is a piece of the work. Okay. I can, you know, like trying to like rationalize, like, what does that even mean in like a little, a little kid brain just, and I didn't know what to say. So I think I probably said, thank you, ma'am, because that's what I've been taught to say to adults, which probably made her feel even worse in hindsight. But yeah. 
Yeah, my dad was somebody who um, he enjoyed challenging people. He certainly enjoyed challenging me and my brother. Um, when he would drop me off at school, he would say, have a good day. Don't be normal, which is also a pun on the name. It's kind of mean in a way. But anyway, but it was good because I never felt like, I never felt like my parents necessarily expected me to be rigidly typical. They were okay with me being a little, a little odd. Did that like give you freedom to explore your creative pursuits? Yeah, I, I was really the only artist in the, like in the immediate family. Um, my brother, when he was younger was, I would say more athletic and really well-spoken kind of thought he'd end up in politics. Um, my mom was obviously well-spoken. She helped people speak all the time. Um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, was artistic. And I think she kind of enjoyed, enjoyed the fact that her non-artistic daughter had had an artistic daughter herself. So, um, Like it skips a generation. Yeah, like, ha-ha. <laughs> you didn't want to learn any of those things, and now your kid does. Um, but she was artistic in a way that her generation allowed, right? So she did quilting and sewing and would sew for people of the community and make quilts and, you know, whatever was kind of fabric based, but with a real engineering brain, like could alter things and make them fit really well or could talk to someone and figure out kind of what they were talking about in a design style. So, I've known you for a little bit. You have a bit of a goth past. Maybe. How did you find that? Well, it was the 90s. I think most people found it because it was the 90s. Um, I don't know, probably through music. And I'm really not sure. I had, I had some mental health struggles in uh, middle school and high school. I was undiagnosed ADHD until in my 30s. So I think pretty early on, I realized that either, well, I mean, when you're little, you kind of internalize stuff, right? So I think I realized that like either something was really wrong with me or I was so rebellious, I didn't know how to stop being rebellious. Like, so I think, yeah, I think I enjoyed the goth kids and the alternative kids and some friends, I had some friends that were skaters. I had, I don't know, I didn't really discriminate. I kind of enjoyed everyone, but I loved the, I think it was the music because I started out really enjoying kind of punk music and then, um, and some, you know, when everything was labeled alternative or not alternative, <laughs> But I think is, you know, back in the day when your only choice for buying music was going to Kmart and pushing the little boxes on the thing that would play little samples of music. And you're like, no, 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 this is all. Oh, that's not bad. Oh, it's Susie Sue. Okay. Maybe I should listen to more. Su oh, and The Cure. I like that too. And then you just kind of like, <laughs> you would kind of like find your own little subculture that way instead of using, I don't know, YouTube or a streaming service that would recommend things. And I think that's how people kind of find their own music genre now. Um, also, I look really good in black. And when you're wearing all black, laundry gets really easy and stains don't show as much if you're doing photography stuff. And it was, it was just easier, easy cop out. Do you think that influenced your photography? Hmm. Maybe. I think, I think sometimes the kids who were the most depressed or who had seen the most or maybe seen more than they should have um, in high school and early college were also the ones who were seeking creative expression that dealt with issues that were a little more psychological instead of 
maybe mainstream. So I think being involved in some of the subcultures and being exposed to them made me realize that there were bigger issues I could talk about in my photography. It didn't have to be pretty. It didn't have to be narrative in a way that maybe was more normalized in the media I could take in at that point. So, yeah, I would say it was probably part of the influence into that way of seeing. So it was part of it, but it wasn't like the necessarily the whole thing. It was like more an overall inspiration. Yeah. yeah and I, I started taking pictures really young. Um, How old were you? Yeah, I was trying to think about that earlier. I don't remember not having a camera. I know that I had, I had a little 110 camera that it was hot pink. Very, very stylish, but they were like, like an ice cream sandwich turned into a camera. They were like these square little rectangles. So the top and bottom were hot pink and the middle was black. Super cool for the time, just saying. Um, but 110 cameras took, it was a little canister with a little bulb at each end that held the film. And you, really, you would literally open the back and shove the little canister in, the little plastic compartment and take pictures. And it took tiny little negatives. So you would get these really grainy, the flash went off with every shot. It was, I think that was probably the precursor to like disposable cameras because people could give them to kids because they were just so cheap. So I have all these slightly out of focus, <laughs> slightly wrongly angled pictures of um, family pets and family members and empty rooms and I don't know, whatever, whatever my brain was like, oh, that's cool. So yeah, I think that was, that was probably the first one. And my family was always taking pictures. My grandparents had Polaroid cameras, um, which I thought was phenomenal. It's like, oh my gosh, it's right there. And then my parents shared a Yashica, like a 1980s Yashica. So there were already cameras around and my family had a computer really early compared to a lot of my friends. Um, I was, on the internet before it had images, when it was just text. It was a blue screen with white text. So, I don't know, I kind of had access to technology and things that made everything seem a lot more accessible, you know. There isn't a point where I'm like, and then I took this class and was like, oh, photography is amazing. It's like, I'd always kind of enjoyed photography. I enjoyed seeing the pictures, the really old pictures of family members. Um, I loved that my grandparents had taken Polaroids of us for all those years. So it wasn't just black and white, you know, I had access to all these things. So you grew up in Tennessee. Did you go to college in Tennessee? Yes. So um, went to a couple of them. <laughs> um, so I started out going to Tennessee Tech, which is in Cookville. And it's a school mainly known for engineering because you can't make money being an artist. So I was gonna be an engineer. And I made it through, it was BE 111, Basic Engineering 111. But I was one of six girls in a classroom of like 150. It was a big stadium room where like the lecture is way down at the bottom. And I just wasn't, I wasn't impressed by my classmates, which sounds like so judgmental and rude, but I just felt like, some of them felt I was only there because I was a woman and therefore I would get scholarships and whatever. Um, and when it came time to like partner up for projects, nobody really wanted to partner up with me. And I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't this is not right. I'm, I'm not feeling this. Um, and I remember I took an art class. I took a drawing class from a phenomenal teacher and was like, I love this and I love this at the college level. I love that I'm learning deeper than the stuff you learn in high school. And then I had to call my parents and tell them I was gonna change majors from engineering to art at an engineering school that didn't have a strong art program. And I remember I, I called my dad, I'm like, so uh, we need to talk <laughs> about some stuff. And he was like, you know what? 
I'll come to you. Let's just, let's talk about it. So we met at a restaurant and I remember looking across the table and being like, I think I'm going to change my major to art. And he just like, which I don't know if he was using like psychologist face, like keep it together, <laughs> you know, like not going to react. This is cool. We can talk, we can get through this. Um, but yeah. And, and I quickly realized if I was, yeah, they weren't thrilled, but, um, I think they were worried that I would not be able to eat as an adult. Like, you can do the math, you can do the engineering course, you know, like, it wasn't that it was too hard, I just didn't want to, which is, I don't know, sometimes that kind of rejection's harder in a way, if you don't, if you just don't want to do something, because then when people are like, well, why didn't you, it's like, I don't have a good reason, except I didn't want to, but it just doesn't feel as good, but, um, so I left Tennessee Tech, I met my husband at Tennessee Tech, and then moved to I think Knoxville and went to a community college really enjoyed it there, but it felt too much like high school again. And I was trying to get away from that teacher talks at me and then I do the worksheet kind of thing. I didn't want to do that anymore. So then I transferred to the university of Tennessee at Knoxville and I loved it. Loved it. So, yeah. So did you take, photography classes in Knoxville? Yes. So I didn't take any photography classes at Tennessee Tech or Pellissippi. I took drawing and I don't remember. I took some random stuff. Um, but in Knoxville, so Derek and I had dated. We got married July 2001. Not a big year historically, 2001, you know especially that fall, September, I started classes at UT. I felt like I was like, okay, I'm in a real university. I'm gonna take like these really cool classes. Um, and the first day of class, or maybe the second week, um, September 11th happened. <laughs> so I was just like, no, 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 come on come on. And Knoxville is not far from Oak Ridge, which is Oak Ridge National Laboratories is where we made the first bomb. So as things were happening and as we're getting these reports, I'm in the basement of the art building in a concrete area that's used for sculpture. So I can't see what's happening. And the planes hit and I was like, do I go pick up my kid from daycare? Do I leave? Well, I don't like, I don't know what the best decision is. So that was a really interesting way to start out my, yay, I made it. I'm finally, oh no. <laughs> now I don't trust anything. Like, how do I feel about the American government? And how do I feel about our culture? And the fact that like this idyllic way that everyone had been living is kind of, it's just gone, just gone, you know? Um, and because I'd already been to two, colleges. Um, most of my classmates were younger than me, which was totally fine, but it was just, there were things that I was worrying about that they weren't worrying about. They, you know, they're like, Oh no, I guess I'll keep going to class. And I'm like, what does this mean for my child? What does this mean for my marriage? Like, do we need to move out of country? You know, like I was, I had these bigger issues going into it. But, um, yeah, I took, I still didn't want to be an artist artist. So I started out majoring in graphic design. It was very demanding. It was a competitive major. And then I took a, I think I took photo one with Baldwin Lee. And I was just like, Oh, Oh, this is good. This is image making. And this is, I can dive into the psychology of what these images mean instead of focusing on how to communicate to get someone to buy something or how to get someone to do something based on the art that I've made. And that was just such a shift. Um, I was not good. I was not good at it. Um, I, Took photo one, fell in love with it. Took photo two, and my photo two class was so rebellious and such a handful 
that they actually called that section of photo two that semester photo two terrible. And the rest of my college time, they're like, are you one of the kids from photo two terrible? I'm like, I am. We were marked because we were, we were a handful and yeah. Um, but then I took, after photo two, you had to be approved to take large format photography. And I went to Baldwin and was like, I really want to take it. Can I, can I get in the class? And I could see he had some hesitation, but I wasn't sure why. And I didn't really care. I really wanted to take the class. So, um, he let me into the class and at the end of, or maybe no, it was probably the middle of that semester. I was showing some work and I remember he was going around talking about everybody's work during critique. And he said, this work is really good. He's like, it's really good. And I don't say that lightly. He's like, honestly, he said this in front of everyone. Honestly, when you said you wanted to sign up for this class, I cringed. He's like, your 35 millimeter work is not that great. He's like, but you're really good with a large format. And A, I was relieved because I was like, please follow it up with a compliment, please. <laughs> My precious ego can't take this. Um, but something about the hands-on nature of large format and now probably digital falls in, under the like spray and pray mentality sometimes. But with 35 millimeter, you had 36 shots. You could just take it and take it and take it and take And we all were shooting on that. For people who might not know, can you explain what large format is? Oh, sure. Sorry. So large format is um, a larger negative. So it, the smallest large format camera is a four by five. So it's each negative is four by five inches. Um, but a lot of large format cameras are like eight by 10 or bigger. So the negatives are an eight by 10 piece of film. Um, Ansel Adams shot large format is one that I can think of immediately. Um, they are a bulky, heavy camera with a bulky, heavy tripod. And each shot can take several minutes to set up while you're adjusting all the little knobs, everything, you're doing everything. Um, some 35 millimeter cameras, film cameras, you know, you could set the exposure and it would figure out other, you know, you could kind of know part of it. You didn't have to know everything. Kind of like DSLRs, you can either put it in automatic mode or manual and kind of like figure out what aperture and shutter speed might mean. Um, but yeah, so 35 millimeter film, I was not that great at. But once I had to take the time to set up the giant camera and to put a hood on and look at the ground glass and really interact with the film and make the image instead of just documenting the image, um, somehow that control instead of like overwhelming me was very satisfying. And going into the dark and developing the sheets of film was very, very, very satisfying. Um, I am not an organized person. <laughs> so each time I developed film, it's like, I think this is going to work. I don't know. Let's see. And so every time there was an image, it was such a celebration of like, yeah, that actually worked. I mean, it should have, I, I did the things I think, but it might not have, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Um, so there was a lot more joy in it than the 35 millimeter work. As you've been talking about it, your your love for photography kind of has like evolved. Did you ever have any goals of like, once I do this, I will have, do you have a bucket list for your photography? Mm. I would say I'm developing a bucket list for my photography. So is that a pun? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> um, so I had my first baby when I was 20 and I became young single mom, you know, like there's, there's these phases you go through where there's like labels applied to you. Um, and then I was married young mom who did photography. Um, and then I was married with two kids and a husband in grad school and I didn't do much photography. So I, I, just in the past couple of years. Now my youngest is 18. 
um, and he's going to Nicolay. And I'm starting to feel like I can just be Norma who does photography instead of the mom who does photography. I don't know. It's weird. It's just, it's kind of an interesting new phase. And a lot of my friends in photography had their 20s to kind of develop their style or what they were really interested in and things that they really wanted to do. And that was just not possible. Um, it was kind of hard graduating and like, one of my good friends at the time was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Hawaii and I'm going to shoot pictures of orcas and live on a boat for two months. And I was like, wow, that's fun. I'm going to be changing diapers. Yeah, that's, that's equivalent. That's equivalent. Yeah. Um, another guy who graduated, he may have graduated the year before me, moved to California and immediately started working for Scorsese. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I'll still be changing diapers, but that's, that's also, that sounds cool. So I didn't really get that phase of my life and I don't fault my kids at all for it. It's not their fault at all. Um, but I think there is something in our culture that's obsessed with you are what you do. So if you're not, if you're a woman and you have small children and you're not photographing weddings or something that's like an easy thing for people to understand as photography, then you're just a mom who does photos. I don't know, it's kind of a hard thing to explain. So I'm excited to be entering this phase where I can go, no, the kids, the kids are old enough. I'm not, I call it not being on active duty. You know, I'm on call um, in the parenting and my husband's established enough, you know, it's much less rocky and unstable compared to what all my friends went through in their 20s. So, yeah, I'm excited to start building out my bucket list and accomplishing things. I don't know what they are yet, but I'll get there. So what do you think through everything and to be able to enter this new phase taking everything that you've learned thus far, what do you think is, was your biggest strength through all of that? Um, stubborn. Yeah, probably stubborn. And well supported. It's kind of weird to be both, right? To be like kind of bullheaded, like, no, I want to do this. And to have a spouse that was like, oh my gosh, please go do the thing. Um, if I don't make art for a while, I get like a weird kind of fidgety and kind of mean, maybe kind of negative. Um, so there has been times where Derek has come in and been like, can you just go make something? I don't care. Make a Christmas wreath. That's not your thing, but whatever, whatever you need to do, go buy the supplies and do it just so you can like get it out of your system. I was supported well enough to be able to just go and do the thing whatever the thing happened to be. And I was stubborn enough to not give up on my love of photography. So like when I left college, most of my friends immediately eBayed their large format camera, anything that they're like, first of all, I need the money. And second of all, I'm not gonna be able to, I don't have a dark room at home. Like I'm, this is not gonna work with the life that I'm in. And I refused, I flat out refused. I was like, I will store this. I'm coming back to this. This is a pause, it might be, 20 year pause, but this is my favorite thing. I'm not, no, I'm not selling my stuff. And good thing I didn't because I don't know that I could afford to start rebuilding some of the stuff that I have at this point. Um, so yeah, stubbornness and support, I think were the things that kept me on it. Nowadays, I know you just got a studio at yes. Artstar. Yes. Um, Tell us what you've been up to nowadays. I know you're you're mm. working with um, the Over It Kids yes. for the, on the skate park stuff. Um, yeah, that's been awesome. I haven't been working with them long, so I don't have like any any good stories. But um, there's soon to be in the process of having a youth art space under Art Start in the basement, um, and three times a month, I get to be in that space with the, the young adults from over it. Um, and they are such a well-spoken, thoughtful group of people. And I feel like I messed up in my teen years because you all are like way advanced of where I was at that point. Um, 
so I get to work with that. I'm working um, with One Nation, One Project, um, which is this group that picked nine sites in the U.S. <clears throat> I think Chicago was on there. I don't know. We've had a couple of conference calls. It's, it's cute, though, because it's all these big cities and then like Harlan, Kentucky, which is county, and then Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And when I first saw the lineup, I was like, and Rhinelander. Like, <laughs> it's just like... It's like someone's little kid brother tagging along to a big event. Um, but they are providing a foundation and some funding to start kind of marrying the ideas of mental wellness and art making. So super excited to be working with that. Um, and then, yes, I have my studio space, um, which is phenomenal. I have been working from home this whole time, but as my interests have changed and grown and, oh, I can do that. Oh, I could totally do that. I had like some of my stuff in one room and some of my stuff in another room. So it's nice to have a studio where I can have everything all together um, and have people come by and visit and be like, hey, if you want to see how I do this, just come over. Um, so you said that you had taken a pause um, just because life happened. Um, did you find it hard getting back into your, your passion or was it just like, finally, I get to do this again or, or what yeah. was that like? Yeah. It was just like, it was like, I'd been holding my breath and I finally took a big inhale and I was just like, yeah, let's do this. I was amazed the first time I developed a role of film. I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to remember how to do, you know, I haven't touched film in years. Am I going to remember how to do this? And I was standing in the dark and I'm putting the film on a developing reel and I pushed it into the reel and I went ticka, 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 ticka at the exact same rate I'd always done it. And I'm like, it went on the reel. So I'm standing in the dark. I'm like, yes, <laughs> that was no problem. And I think I even ran upstairs and told Derek like, Three minutes. It took me three minutes to load. Like the first time I loaded a reel of film, it probably took me 10. So I expected some of that knowledge to have fallen off, eroded over time, but it was just like muscle memory. It's like, okay, yeah, let's do this. And then I mix this chemistry and it's going to be great. So what is it about that process that you love so much? I think some of it is just the fact that it is a process. It's like, I tend to rush through things <laughs> and not be real careful. And when I'm working in a dark room or even a dim room, when I'm doing cyanotypes, it doesn't have to be pitch black, it just has to be a little darker. Um, I can't necessarily have my phone out because of light exposure and I can't have my watch on. So I'm kind of like, in a quiet, sacred space where I get to make, and that time is mine. It is guarded. Once I start that process, I know I can't just stop and go off to something else. For someone whose brain's constantly going, oh, but what if, oh, but maybe we should go do this. It's kind of nice to have a space where I can just fall into the making of something and have something to show at the end. And then last but not least, if people want to engage with your artwork and take a look at some of the things you do, which you should, her cyanotypes are really, really awesome. Where do we, where do we find you? What would be the best place? So for online, it would be Instagram. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Both of them are artistic.norma. Um, so A-R-T-I-S-T-I-C dot Norma. And then... Um, I have, I keep work at Child's Frame Shop. I always want to say Jaren's Frame Shop. I'm so sorry, but Child's Frame Shop and Rhinelander. And um, sometimes my work is published in The Hand magazine. So if you're nowhere near this area, if you can find a copy of The Hand, you can see my work. All right. Well, thank you, Norma, yeah, for joining us today. If you are interested in sponsoring an episode of Mindset or have a guest suggestion, please reach out at andrew at inspiredigitalstudios.com. 
That's Andrew at InspireDigitalStudios.com. Mindset is produced by Inspire Digital Studios.